Please welcome John Trudell. Thank you. Well, I'd like to um, say I'm pleased to be here and I'm really glad that you're here. And I don't know exactly where we're going tonight, so if I say anything that you don't agree with, that's just what it is. <laughs> we just don't agree. But I'll start with some poems and then we'll just, we'll see. In the reality of many realities, how we see what we see affects the quality of our reality. We are children of earth and sky, DNA, descendant, now ancestor, human being, physical spirit, bone, flesh, blood as spirit, metal, mineral, water as spirit. We are in time and space, but we're from beyond time and space. The past is part of the present. The future is part of the present. Life and being are interwoven. We are the DNA of Earth, Moon, planets, stars. We are related to the universal. Creator created creation, spirit and intelligence with clarity being and human as power. We are a part of the generations of evolution. We are a part of the memories. These memories carry knowledge. These memories carry our identity beneath race, gender, class, age, beneath citizen, business, state, religion. We are human being. And these memories are trying to remind us human beings, human beings. It is time to rise up. Remember who we are. Famine in the plenty. Patience burns quick. Waiting for the rich, but the rich won't hurry. The rich eat us, so the rich don't worry. In the sun's shadow, Water melts into cold, running rivers of want. Want needs justice, but justice is just ice in those rivers of want. The stars in the night have seen it all. What isn't remembered takes time to weep. The soul isn't empty, yet it feels that way. Confusion in the happy place. The great lie is one with all the little lies, edges of breaking dreams, cutting into other dreams. I want to talk a little bit about who we are, because I think the coherency of our future depends upon us knowing who we are, and I mean truly understanding who we are. Because our relationship to reality and our relationship to power is based upon that understanding. But sometimes I feel like I'm in a reality where we don't remember who we are, so therefore we don't know who we are. We speak a language we don't understand, and because of this we don't know where we are. And I think that we live in a technologic reality, that these conditions are the result of a mining process. I'm going to call it a mining process. And there's a reason we are in this situation, but it's got to do with being fed upon by a system. So I want to go to who we are. See, we're the human beings. And it's very important because we all know how to say the words. We know the terms. I know we know the terms because they taught them to us. They programmed this to us. And the, 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 the words, human beings. But our relationship to reality 
is in that definition. So human, the bone, flesh, and blood, the DNA of the human, the bone, flesh, and blood is literally made up of the metals, minerals, and liquids of the earth. So we are parts of the earth. We are shapes of the earth. We're forms of the earth. This is the form that we are. All of the things of the earth have the same DNA as the human does. Everything of the earth has the same DNA as the human. Everything is made up of the metals, minerals, and liquids of the earth, but the shape is just different. And the purpose is different. And being, we have being. That's our essence, that's our spirit. And all of the things of the earth have the same DNA as the human has, so all the things of the earth have being. Spirit. And our relationship to power and reality is in that understanding of who we are. We are forms of the earth, and that's reality. Nothing will ever change that reality. What has changed is our perceptional <laughs> relationship to reality. And what has happened to us through the millennium and through this whole technologic perception of reality, what has happened to the human beings, is I... To me, it's like a disease in one way. It's like this thing just kind of spreads. And as it diseases the spirit of the people, it affects the perception of reality. So in one way, it's kind of like that. It's like a possession. But in another way, it's almost like a mechanical thing, this mining process that takes place. And it's almost like this thing that they call technologic civilization. See, it's predatory upon our lives. Anybody ever feel something's missing from their life? Like purpose or understanding or self-worth or self, whatever the deal is, they're mining us, <laughs> all right? They're mining us. And one of, the, one of the objectives of this whole technologic, civilized, perceptional reality has got to do with erasing the memories of the human beings because we have a common collective experience. We are all the descendants of tribes. Back in the time of the original dream, see, we were all tribes and we were all the earth's children and we all knew that the earth was our mother. And that we were a part of a spiritual reality, see, because we had being. We understood that there was a spiritual reality, and we were physical in a spiritual reality. We being who we are today, however we landed in this reality, whoever we are today, we carry the genetic experience of our lineage from the very beginning. It's encoded in the DNA. It's like a genetic memory. Something about the experience of the journey. We have it in us. It's like... But anyway, within our genetic memories, within our genetic memories, somewhere hidden in there, we all come from a people. Every one of us comes from a people that understood that we lived in a spiritual reality. And because we lived in a spiritual reality, every one of our beginning ancestral peoples understood that life was about responsibility. So we were responsible for the past and the future as well as the present. And we understood that all things had being. So we knew who we were. We understood what we were saying. And we knew where we were. We knew our purpose. And this reality lives in our genetic memory. Because, see, as human beings, whoever we are, the individuals we are now, that experience is there. It's at 90% of the brain to tell us we can't use. <laughs> so they're using it. <laughs> Earth DNA pulls, genetic memory, ancient spirit, sky, father sky, the magic valley, earth, mother earth, childhood distances, hard to remember what was never to be forgotten, never to be forgotten, predators stalk, all living things, the death mask feeds on living essence, feelings become fugitives, Emotions are cold alibis. When hurt can't hurt anymore. Raged ones rise. Feeding the beast, all aggression is justified and the beast grows. Flow of thought harnessed into mindsets. A damning, diseased spirits. Cannibals and vampires feast. Mining minds in civilized ritual. 
the religion of business and machine, pay homage to technologic gods. At material altars, the mass prays a prayer of need and wanting more. Earth DNA pulls, genetic memory, ancient spirit, sky, father sky, the magic valley, earth, mother earth, what was never to be forgotten, children of earth, what we see affects our realities, what is always to be remembered, the beast needs us to believe, always to be remembered, free our minds, free the reality. We all understand that in this technologic reality that we live, this technologic dimensional reality that we live in, we understand that they can take the DNA of the earth that is called uranium in that shape and form. So they can take that DNA of the earth that is uranium and it has being, spirit, and they can take it from the earth and they put it through a mining refinement process and convert the being part of that uranium into a form of energy, electrical energy, that they call power. And in a way it is power, but, but in reality it's a mutated form of power. And after they do this kind of a process, then, then we, under, you know, we know that there's toxic waste and that there's poison left over from it. And we know they do it with fossils. Take that old dinosaur DNA and put it through the mining refining process and convert the being of that DNA into a form of energy that runs, again, another electrical system. And that also leaves behind its pollutions and its things. See, so I think that they're doing it to us. Because we come from the same reality, we're made up of the same thing. Our shape is different. That's all. Our shape and our function is different because our shape is different. But you come down to the genetic makeup of all of it, or the majority of water, but water has metals in it and it has minerals in it. See, but I think as a part of that reality, see, that we're being mined, the being part of human is being mined. It's being mined by a perception of reality. And the people who enforce that perception of reality by indoctrinating it into every generation of human beings that is born. See, so, to me, one of the purposes of this technologic perceptional civilization is that we are the fuel that runs it. And the poison, the toxic that is left over from the mining of the being part of human through the human, through the intelligence of the human. All right, all the fears and doubts and insecurities that, that we have in our lives within our own personal reality about who we are, the things that others don't see, that's the pollution and the toxic left over from the mining of the being part of human. That's the pollution that's left over, see, because in that kind of a haze, see, we don't see ourselves clearly. We do not see and recognize clearly who we are, and we're never encouraged to. We're encouraged to be good citizens or good this religion or good that religion or good, you know, good workers, good, <laughs> yeah. but we're never encouraged to be real about human beings. In a way, we're never really encouraged to be good to ourselves. See, we're mentally and psychologically oppressed and manipulated so that we seek things to gratify ourselves, but that doesn't mean we bring good to ourselves. In the mining process, to me, you know, it's the civilizing process itself. Because somewhere in there, it's like someone's eating spirit. Our spirit is being converted into an energy to run something. All right, and it's like it's eating our spirit. See, and, you know, everyone has their religions and their stuff, see, but it makes me wonder, how do we participate in this spiritual reality? If we live in a mechanism now where the human has been conditioned and trained to eat its own spirit and turn it into fuel for the system. Moths and other sacred wings, butterflies and bees whisper. In breath of the wind, blessed ways, blessing way things. Dreams are the mind's streams. Thought pictures of the spirit. There are dreams of the day. There are dreams of night. Thinking and dreaming are related. Dreams of the day we make our own. Dreams of night. 
part of eternal stone. There are dream takers taking from dream worlds, taking dreams as a way of stealing thoughts, turning minds inside and out. Dream slavers want to change our connections to ourselves, mess with our dreams, make us unsure, unclear about right and wrong, feed our dreams and instincts to industrial profit machine. Difference between dream and fantasy, reality and illusion, center and no center. Dreams of the day keep our spirit alive, our creative mind, who we really are. With dreams we can create and heal, follow our original purpose. Dreams are protection, good medicine, blessed way, blessed way things. Sun and moon continue. We are all on one journey. So life was about responsibility. And the earth was the mother. And at some point in the evolution of the human beings, another perception of reality appeared. And this perception of reality it took the spirit away from the animals and all of the other things and it started changing spirit into human form, the gods and the goddesses. So at some point in the evolution, see, it started to take the way the people prayed. But it has to do with iron and bronze and all these things being, being starting to become mind. So it's like it kind of evolved in this kind of a way. It's like, see, in a way religion emerged, in it, but it was like a mining tool for the technologic reality that was manifesting itself through industrialization. But it became almost like a tool, see, because you got to go to the center of where the human being is, because all human beings want to know where we come from and where we're going, what's our purpose. So you've got to go there if you're going to mess with them. You have to go there to the very beginnings. The beginnings and the heart of the spiritual realities. So, the God thing evolved, the religious thing that changed the creation story from being a creation story to where there was a new story. And this new story was that there was a male dominator God removed from the earth who owned everything because he made it. <laughs> so he owned it. All right. Now, at this point in our common collective genetic ancestral memory, every one of our relations back in that time rejected this. Because life worked for them. Because the earth was the mother and the sky was the father. It's like the great spirit. The spirits, everything, it worked for them. They maintained a balance. They knew who they were. They knew what their purpose was. They knew their relationship to power. They knew everything about their lives. So it worked for them. But they were forced to accept this other perceptional reality through violence and terror and aggression. Same thing happened to the Indians here by the descendants of the tribes of Europe happened to the tribes of Europe and their descendants. That's why they behaved the way they did when they got here. And this is where I think sexism comes from. I think it comes from our relationship to the earth. See, I think sexism was one of the mining tools because when you're going to convince all of the human beings in whatever tribes that they're in, as you come into contact with them, you had to turn them against the earth to promote this male god thing to alter the perceptional reality. So this is where sexism came. It came as a way because, see, as long as the people considered themselves to be the children of the earth and a part of the earth, they would not plunder the earth. They would not aid and abet or accept the plundering of the earth because the earth is their mother. See, so that's why sexism came in as a way because in order to attack the earth amongst the human beings they came into contact with, they had to attack their perceptional reality about the woman in relationship to the earth and life. So sexism, so it, became, it was like a mining tool to help turn us against the earth and make the earth available for plunder. So in order to have all this experience get dumped down in our ancestral past because it was all like what I'm saying is this mining process. As the technology grew, the, the ways and methods of mining remained the same. And it's almost like a predatory behavior. They never, the behavior pattern never really changes itself. What the behavior pattern does is it just outlasts the generations. 
So after five generations are gone, the behavior pattern can be as predatory as it ever was, like medieval civil, uh, Europe. The behavior pattern can be as aggressive as it ever was, because after five generations, who's going to remember what was there? The terminology changes, the technology changes. So it's like there's this thing that's just kind of been, to me, <laughs> right? That's a part of this civilization that just, it just kind of remanifests itself, but the continual thing is it eats our spirit, to me. It used, converts, feeds off of us in some kind of a way. See, so this is why it's important to separate everybody from any ancestral understandings and teachings because, see, they don't want anybody to know this. So everybody thinks they got hope. And the thing continues to spread because you women, look at what the women's suffrage was in, in the 1800s. So now you have the right to vote and you made certain little gains, but see, it's still the same war. And the concessions are given very slowly. And it's, it's this way with labor, it's this way with all of the things. But anyway, it's behavior pattern basically remains the same. And its means of conducting its behavior pattern, that's what really changes. And, and the generation of people that it gets conducted on, this changes. But in order for all this stuff to happen, they have to neutralize our intelligence. They have to create a confusion in our own perceptional reality. So somewhere in each and every one of us, there's a collective genetic memory that goes way back to the beginning of the original dream, the beginning of our stories. And our relationship to power in reality is connected to us understanding that that is there. But we're in a technologic perception of reality that does not want us to understand that. The voice has said, Antichrist is anti life, greed, death's agents taking command, society conditioned in death, death to the air, death to the water, death to the future, death in the mind. The voice has said, People strung out in confusion, dancing at ends of industrial wires, reactionary lives, reactionary minds, forgetting who we are, disguising servitude, fooling ourselves in lies of freedom. The voices said industrial needs, human beings don't really matter. Their labor does, energy consumed, submission in many forms is submission not recognized material prisons, racial prisons, sexual prisons, chemical prisons, system prisons, angry prisons, slamming cell doors, shut in human minds. The voice has said we are Earth's children. The people must stand strong. Our will is our life. Man respect woman, brother help sister, young help old, relative help relative, nation help nation. The voice has said Entering and leaving, we gather strength. When we know power, we are power. When we know peace, we are peace. When we know the time, we are the time. It's like severing our relationship to power is the objective. Our use of our intelligence See, and our coherency. So all this cloudy is created, this illusion, because really it is. Crazy or said we live in the shadow of the real world, see, and we really, really do. Under the male dominator creator theory, see, all spiritual value really is removed away from the earth. So the earth isn't your mother anymore. The earth is the dominion and property of this new God, and you are to subdue it. See, that's like Martians landing, it really is, see, because it's a completely different perceptional reality. Going from caring for the earth, all right, to dominating the earth. And incidentally, you know, as a part of this process, see, you, <laughs> incidentally, you created a moral crime for being born. <laughs> so therefore, you have to listen to the authority of this new male god because you made a crime for being here. You see, before, before that was brought here, life was a gift. 
So when, when you were born, it was like an exchange of gifts, a, a gift to a gift. And even dying was like a gift because it was, once again, it was an exchange of life because we were part of a spiritual reality as physical beings. But anyway, this other thing she changed about there was something wrong with us for being born. See, and it's maybe a big thing. or See, to me, I think it's a major thing because, see, the first time that human being gets this, that they're guilty, all right, for being born, it alters their perception of self. It alters them from seeing themselves from the reality of who they are because they're picking up someone's illusion and they're viewing themselves through the illusion. And the way that that illusion seems to work, see, people don't learn from their guilt. They just make new guilts. See, so it, to me, in the end, it becomes a deal about irresponsibility. So even though all the words are being said, see, it's an irresponsible behavior. It's an irresponsible behavior because we are responsible for what we do. But when they condition us to feel guilty, and then we have to listen to their chain of command and be submissive to them, we are not taking responsibility. And we are not showing respect to our creator, whoever it is, all right, for the gift of intelligence and life. Been hanging out down south of hell, playing to the music of a broken bell. Hard times and beating myself up inside my head. How was the walking wounded or the living dead? Tie a yellow ribbon around my brain. My mind booked, it's been gone so long. Rash traveling with mad and insane. Tears fell like tears, rain fell like rain. Shadow man called, catch me if you can, knowing he can't be caught. He's the shadow man. Trickster turned free into junk and a rubber room. And junkie fix has even stolen from the moon. Leaders know they can't trust ones who follow. Followers know not to trust ones who lead. Love, hate, despair, and promises turn narcotic. If everything's normal, then reality's psychotic. Claiming to understand dimension and space, Babylon huffs and puffs, bullying around in the natural order, temptation rules in the valley of fools. Celestial cannibals feast on essence. The civilized hide out from their lives. The traumatized worry about everything. Hypnotized, worrying into nothing at all. Been hanging out down south of hell, playing to the music of a broken bell. Hard times and beating myself up inside my head. I was the walking wounded or the living dead. Now, intelligence, and all of this stuff happens through our intelligence. And just to have an example of how, how much of a relationship we have to power through our intelligence. Let's go into our own individual personal realities, the ones that nobody gets to see in. You know, and let's look at, okay, how much of this pollution, how much, how much of my life is affected by my fears and my doubts and my paranoias and my insecurities, the things I hide from everybody but I can't hide from me even though I try. How much of my reality is affected by that? And then how much does that affect the realities of the people that I'm closest to? This is power. This is the power of our intelligence. And I define intelligence as our imagination, our creativity, our thoughts, and our actions upon these things. See, so however, whatever the, the answer is, however the negativity, the toxic, is working within our reality, Whatever kind of power it has in the way our lives unfold, well, that's how we're using our imagination, our creativity, and our thoughts. Because we have been programmed and conditioned to use that, to use our intelligence in that manner. And mining takes place like, it's like sleight of mind. <laughs> we're told... The more money we make, the more powerful we become. But that's not true, <laughs> right? The more money we make, the more access to authority we have, but it has absolutely nothing to do with power, really. It's about authority. And in actuality, in the actual actuality, authority represents an absence of power. 
That's why it is needed. But we're told, or whoever has the biggest army, that makes them powerful. But it doesn't. It gives them violent access to authority. But as we go through our lives trying to seek our own personal self-empowerment and all of these kinds of terminologies and these things that we're looking for, we're not going to synchronize it if we call authority power, if we don't understand the certain reality, see, because we don't want authority. We don't want all of the money. We don't want all of the guns. See, so these are not things that we really want to have. But if we look at that as being power, then we do not see ourselves clearly as power. Because what I'm starting to get an understanding of, we live in a reality they don't want us to see clearly. They do not want us to see clearly. They do not want us to act coherently. And who is they? Just for lack of a better way, I'm just going to say it's that industrial ruling class that is basically colonizing this planet. All right? And operating and creating a class of ethnic rich. Because when they talk about ethnics, you know, the smallest number are the rich. <laughs> they are the minority in a majority system. The minority is the richest. Okay? <laughs> So our relationship to power is connected to our relationship to the earth and the use of our intelligence. Because any clear, coherent thinking society, we would not live the way that we live today if this was a coherent, free thinking, clear thinking society. And I know that, and we all know that. We live this way because we have to accept certain things See, but the biggest obstacle to me in getting after what we need to get after is in how clearly we see ourselves. Because again, to respect this about our intelligence and about showing respect to our creator, see, then we need to be real to ourselves. We should be able to face the reality of who we are no matter what it is we do in this reality. If there's any respect of the self, we owe it to ourself. If there's any respect, see, because, because all these things manifest. See, if it's weak at the heart, then it's going to be weak as you go out and as it goes out into the world. So we have to respect the self enough to be real to who we are. And it will help the synchronization of things in general in the long run. It truly will help. See, but if we have to hide from ourselves, then everything we do is going to be altered by that little alteration, our reality. The realities we seek or dream or chase, they're going to be altered because of that that. That way, because we're, we're not concentrating and using the power of who we are, but we're altering it. See, so we should always be real to ourselves. We should always do this. Even if our truths are shameful or glorious, it doesn't matter. I'm not saying judge it. I'm saying face it. If it makes us uncomfortable and we can live with it, then fine. We are, we're uncomfortable and we live with it. If it's something we can't handle, then fine. We can't handle it. And it all evolves through the behavior pattern. It evolves through our life. But we need to be real to ourselves. That is a part of our spiritual responsibility that never, ever goes away. It's coming back, all the way back to the ancestral beginning, the collective genetic memory. See, that was a part of our responsibility, was to be real while we were here. And we have that ability. It's just that we have been mind manipulated in such a way. See, that that being part of human truly is being changed into a form of energy. See, and so it's got to do with how we think and how we use our intelligence. You know, because there are no solutions to any of the problems in front of us now, all right? There are only ways of dealing with them. But any solution, see, if we clear our individual and our collective intelligence and coherency and clarity, if we would set forth to clear, to make our intelligence clear and our perceptual reality a little bit more coherent, we set in that direction individually, collectively, then answers will come. We were born 18. If you think we're strange, you ought to see the others. We were born 18. In the middle of a Babylon dream. It's a crying shame is the name of the game. Learning how to ride out the storm. What did we take? What did we steal? What did we keep? What did we waste? We wandered with neon eyes among broken lights out of sync fantasies unbecoming to reality, turning over images for others to see. 
What we can't face looks for us anyway, breathing down our necks, these breaths of fire. We fought the cannibals, still nothing settled. With all these hungers to go around, masters of disguises, living double lives, hiding and smiling, we were born 18. Nothing we can do but conjure what we need. The work going on is the work going on, it's just more pyramids and slaves, wasting lives to the royal flush. Nothing new happening here, nothing new. We were born 18. If you think we're strange, you ought to see the others. We were born 18, in the middle of a Babylon dream. It's a crying shame, is the maim of the game. Every word has power. Every word has power. And the power of every word is that every word has its own precise meaning. If you mean this and you use that word to mean this, then see, you're not, something's not synchronizing. <laughs> because every word has its own meaning. Because every word comes from somewhere, it's in here, what it, it's, it comes from the feeling, somewhere in this process, the feeling, the thought, seeing the feeling, that's how the being speaks to the human is through feelings. And how the human handles how the feelings are, the human uses emotions to suppress the feelings or manipulate the feelings. But anyway, every word that comes out, at some point it's coming from all of our centers, and we're turning it into sound, and we're tossing it into the, the world of vibration, the vibratory world, the vibration of sound, it's like throwing a pebble in it pond. Something happens. Now believe is a word that I have a serious problem with, right? Because it's got a lie in the middle. B-E-L-I-E-V-E. -E -E. So it makes me look at this word very, very carefully. See, I come from people who have beliefs, so I respect that. But, you know, it kind of drives me a little bit nutty just kind of just generally in the conversation that floats around in the society that we're in, how many times I hear I believe? <laughs> it does. It's, oh, man. See, and I, I don't mean any offense to anyone, see, but I'd, I'd be breathing a whole lot better if everybody was saying, I think. <laughs> you know? I'd breathe a whole lot better. <laughs> because sometimes believe, number one, it's a passive word. It's not active. It's a passive word. It means we're not thinking. Because I think, again, when one looks at the mining process, when is it in our belief process, all right, that we stop thinking? You know, when is it that, well, I believe this, so I no longer really think about it? Or I pretend to think about it, but in my pretend thinking, what I'm really doing is I'm, I'm pretend thinking about it within the, the definitions and limitations of my belief. I'm not going outside and looking at this thing. I'm thinking about it within the limitations of my belief. See, in everything that was ever done to us, in our collective genetic ancestry, everything that was ever done to us was to make us believe them. <laughs> everything, to believe the way they wanted us to believe because that's the most intricate part of the mining thing, to get us to believe, because if we don't believe them, they can't mine us. So they put every kind of confusion and clarity out there for us to believe, but it all emanates from them. And the way it all emanates from them is that we really have no value without them. But yet, I come from people who have beliefs, and I, and I, I respect those beliefs because I'm, you know, I'm a product of those beliefs, but I'm saying we need to understand how we use the word when we use the word. And thinking, the gift of intelligence, we think our own misery and insecurity every damn day, and every one of us has a form of it, and I know that we do because it got us all. So when we're thinking like that, you know, and we're believing a lot of stuff that's negative about us and that is completely negative to reality, and we're being fed upon by our beliefs, it is in our best interest. Whatever our creator is that we say we respect and we pray to, it is in our best interest to respect the gift that that creator gave us, which is our lives, and it means that we use our intelligence to think a little more clearly, then that's what we need to do. Because about the thinking part, see, we can't stop. <laughs> we never stop. Even when we sleep, we dream. We just don't, either we remember it or we don't, but it's always going. It's just sometimes we're turned off to the process. See, so this, there's so much 
power in there. Because everything that happened to us happened to alter our perceptional reality. And that's the basis of what happens today. So anyway, what ended up happening here, as it manifested itself, I live now in this century, whatever time frame we're in now, right? We're in it. And I look around and I see that I live in a society where the people feel powerless. They're angry, they're pissed off, they're frustrated, you know? There are a lot of things, but they feel powerless. And you can see it, you can see it in a calm collective psyche because they allow, they allow the lie, they just accept the lie, <laughs> right? Vote and it'll get better, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, right? And see what I'm saying, so and I'm not trying to overthrow anything, but I wanna say this about democracy, you know, I, there's a timeline here, and I'm, I don't know where I'm at on it, so I might be getting short. But I want to say this about democracy, and I want to say this about freedom. It's not about freedom, right? And I be care, I, me personally, I'm very careful of people and how they use the word freedom because, you know, sometimes we use it, we're habitual users, <laughs> you know? And a word like freedom, see, because to me, the, the lie that I see in freedom is if, if I believe in my freedom, that means I make the rules. So that means I have to accept everybody's deal of freedom. See, the racist has the freedom to be a racist. Like, I got the freedom to be a nut. Because if I get to decide freedom, then every human being has the right to make that decision for themselves. Otherwise, it's a lie. It, it, it keeps us from synchronizing all the things that we want to synchronize, like our intent and our consciousness and our motives, the many, because, because we, we don't understand exactly what it means. See, it's about responsibility, I'm telling you. It's, about, it's not about freedom or our rights. In some ways, on some lower level ways it is, but in the reality, it's about our responsibility. We take our responsibility and exercise our responsibility and we will be free and our rightful place will be manifested. We want our responsibilities. We want our responsibilities. We will take our responsibilities. See, then the, then the whole issue of freedom and rights, that's going to get solved real quick. It'll, in an evolutionary reality, when, when we understand that it's about taking responsibility, then we will solve many of these problems at a much more accelerated rate. <laughs> Because that's really what it's about. Because they've got us chasing certain abstractions. But I know if I'm locked up in a cage, I want my freedom. See, I understand that. See, so some kind of a way, then there's ways maybe the words should be used and we should be careful about the words, how we're using them. Because it's very central to how we get to participate in this reality. Us understanding that all the words have power. You know, it's like, and, I, and I'm not trying to trash on anybody's gods or anybody's belief, anything, right? <laughs> and actually... I don't particularly want you to believe me. See, but if it's there and there's something to think about, that's what I want, is like to think about it. And a wisp of smoke down on the corner. There was this cat named Fortunate Lee talking at me from voices in his head, yelling about what storyteller said. You've got to be careful here, child. There's a beast in the promised land. There's madness you don't understand. The beast is crazed and running wild. Little boy, man, little girl, woman, no big deal. Nothing personal. Your mind is another meal. Savoring the rush of you like heady wine. Feeding is what the beast is meant to do. Stranger those walls built to hide. Stranger to look and learn not to see. He's in the mask you put on your face. Thought is his favorite breeding place. In the race to midnight, it's after 11. The nature of the beast is all he knows. Behind doors of hell are gates of heaven. The doors are open, but the gates are closed. See, so certain things just got to be looked at. Distinctions have got to be made. And our intelligence, this is our way through, you know, it's like we need to define our own reality for one thing, <laughs> you know. We seriously need to define our own reality because whatever it is, I'm going to say, 
that people believe in or show respect to or to worship, however they express it to their creator, if they don't use their intelligence as intelligently, as often as they can, if they don't use it to continually on a daily basis, wake up, <laughs> on a daily basis, strive to seek clarity and coherence. If they do not do that, then to me, my own personal opinion, then all the other stuff see, it's just neutralized. Because the gift that this entity gave to us is the valuable gift and it's our way through everything. It's the evolutionary protection. See, but we're allowing them to mine us and we're just kind of trash and beating ourselves up inside of our heads and going along with the program. So something has to be re-looked at. You know, to me, see, it's more than, non, more than non-violent civil disobedience. It's more than a lot. See, somewhere in there, the, the deal is about non-cooperation. See, non-cooperation. See, I mean, ideally, what I would like to see someday is for on one given agreed upon day without putting anybody else's ideas or ideologies or political agendas or anything, just one agreed upon day when nobody would spend any money. You got to go to work, you got to do your stuff, but they won't spend any money. See, because any access to power that the collective mass has now, all right, and it's diminishing rapidly, all right, but any access to power that the collective mass has now in dealing with this system is just by not cooperating, by not participating. See, so if for one day, I, I think it should be done in standing fast for the earth and kind of fast without money for one day, right, and do all your shopping the day before, the day after, because the way they're balancing this economic lie about the economy is doing really good and better than it's ever been, the way they're balancing all these books, they need that daily consumption from everybody and they need as much as they can get from everybody. Didn't God say that the seven day was to rest? See, so there's people in here, I mean, people in this reality who, who cannot be offended by this idea. <laughs> because if a significant number do it, that it can't be ignored. It's an exercise in power, is exactly what it is. You know, what the reality of our access to power really is. I saw Columbus the other day. He's a wino on 6th and Main. Every day blotting out something he can't quite remember. I saw Henry VIII crying in the eyes of a battered woman. Hiding from a violence she didn't know how she got herself into this. I saw Caesar in a foot soldier. Needing a job. Waiting for his bullet. Patriotic fever. Not understanding war. Just following orders. I saw pharaohs, princes and queens in a haze unlike a dream. Industrial peasants all in a row. Why aren't their lives their own? I saw a Nazi in a worn out lie. Nourishing prophets with blood and spirit. National security, the needle we are injected through. I saw a chance today. Reality connected to our shadow. How we live clears it all up. When we learn, we stop paying. By the time Columbus got here in 1492, see, people have many opinions about him, who he was or what he was, but whatever, see, he was really like the virus. <laughs> you know? And it, the, the spirit was being eaten by disease and it affected the perceptional reality of the human. See, so when Columbus and them got here and we told them who we were, they didn't know. <laughs> we said, well, we're the people, we're the human beings. But they didn't know because it wasn't a part of their perceptional reality. <laughs> the concept was no longer a part of their perceptional reality. See, this is what happened to the tribes of Europe and the descendants of the tribes of Europe. And so I know that by the time Columbus got here, and I, I got a pretty good idea way before that, but, but by the time Columbus got here, the idea of a human being and people in that kind of a way was no longer a part of their perceptional reality. And, and, and we'll look at, but what did, what did Columbus come out of? See, when he got here, this hemisphere had no protection to this disease. 
because it had never been here like that. <laughs> so there was no immune system to the disease as it moved because the disease came through the wind and the water. So it was airborne in a way and water carried. So it just took the shape of a man rather than something you can't see. But it arrived. All right, and this spirit that was being eaten, which made this diseased perception of reality. So by the time Columbus got here, all right, let's look about, about 1100 A.D. or 1000 A.D. The church made the decision that it was God's government. It was the authority of God on earth, so it was God's government. And at that time, the descendants of the tribes of Europe no longer remembered that they, were, that they come from tribes. This wasn't really a part of their conscious reality. Because by 1000 A.D., see, they had been owned by, <laughs> they'd been owned for many, many, many generations by, by whoever claimed ownership of the land and started owning the land. And then they became, they became fiefs and they became uh, serfs and they became peasants. So they really had no reality about being a part of the tribe anymore because they were just the property that was owned like whoever the landlord was or the royalty at any given time that owned that land or claimed that land. They belonged to that land like all of the other natural resources of the land. But they still prayed to spirits. See, they still, the women still had a, a, a stronger role yet from the old tribal way, and they still prayed to spirits. So the church, by 1000 AD or 1100 AD, it decided that it was now going to mine this resource. I mean, save the souls of the heathen, see. So the church created the Inquisition, and basically the Inquisition was, number one, is it was to change the perceptual reality of the descendants of the tribes of Europe. All right? And so they were terrorized and brutalized for 500 years in order to do this. But, but the way the church rationalized this was they were going to save, they wanted to possess the souls of the heathens and the pagans. See, they wanted to possess their souls in the name of, of their Lord, all right, so th this war was to, about possessing the souls of the descendants of tribes of Europe. And in order to possess their souls, they had to alter their perceptional reality. So if you thought differently than the church wanted you to think, bingo, you were, you were killed. And you were tortured and your property was taken. And if somebody accused you, basically you were guilty if you were accused. You don't know, incidentally, during the torturing process, you'd probably say somebody else's name. So now somebody else is going to... Kind of, so they killed as efficiently as they possibly could with the technology they had at hand at the time. And they did it for 500 years. By the time Columbus got here, it had been going on for 400 years. And by, so by the time Columbus got here, let's say 20 years to a generation, just for the lifespan during that time frame. All right. So by the time Columbus got here, the descendants of the tribes of Europe had been through 20 generations of having their spirit just completely attacked. And the way this possessed thing kind of just seems to manifest itself. So they became spiritually and physically now the possession of something else. See, then it, before that it was just physically. Now they had become spiritually the possession of someone else. See, so they had no clarity about reality. So by the time Columbus got here, see, they didn't know what it meant to be a human being anymore. It was just not a part of their spiritual perceptional relationship to reality. They were possessed, they were owned, they were property. You know, and, and one of the other things about this that kind of evolved out of that, I think it evolved out of that, was anyway, when the church was doing all of this to get the descendants of the tribes of Europe, all right, they, they finally figured out, well, hold it, if I want to stay alive and be a descendant of anything, I'm going to have to accept these people. <laughs> so they embraced the church because they had to embrace what they feared. So they had to love what they feared in order to survive. And what they had to love, the thing that they had to love that they feared was possessing them. So it's like love and fear and possession as a perceptional reality be kind, of, kind of became intertwined at that time and the human beings have not been able to sort it out yet. So that affected everyone in some kind of a way that's not been healthy for us as human beings. So anyway, anything and all of these things that have happened to us through our generational evolution has been a learning experience and has been a part of our evolutionary experience. See, but I think that we're in the right time. <laughs> we're in the right place at the right time, even if we don't quite get it.
Yeah, I, I don't think that we're here. There's a reason we're here. We're here at the time for us to be here. That's why us and the lives that we have lived that brought us to this place and that we will live when we leave this place. There's a reason that we're here. And part of it is, I know we're here at the right time and we're in the right place. It's just how, how are we going to start perceiving reality? You know, and that's just really where it starts to, it starts to become more clear. Out of self-respect, we owe it to ourselves. Out of respect of self, we owe it to the selves of others, you know, to be. Let's use our intelligence as intelligently as we can, as often as we can, right? It's not even saying all the time, but maybe we get there someday. To understand, you know, there are moments in our lives, there are times in our lives when coherency would probably be the best thing to do, <laughs> you know, before one deals with what's there in front of them. Because a part of the, what this confusion that I call that this pollution that's left over in our perceptional reality, see, has got to do is they don't want us to think. Okay, this is the deal. Whoever this miner is, <laughs> the way this thing works, they don't want us to think. I mean, I didn't really understand it. I knew this, but I didn't understand it. I knew this a long time ago because at one point when I realized somewhere along the way that there was like these 17,000 pages of stuff on me, right? And I thought... Hold it here, what did I do, you know? Because I know what I did, <laughs> you know? So I know this was, I know how I participated. And just once it sunk into me about all of this had been done around someone like me, right? And it made me think, well, I understand what they fear now. I mean, I know what they fear. I know their paranoia. Because sometimes I can be coherent. See, and they, they don't like that. Right? They don't like it when I'm coherent in front of people because then we're coherent together. See, whether we agree with one or another or not isn't the point. They just don't want us to be coherent individually or together. Right? And so that's really what I figured out. This is why they have to have people spying on people and they got to do all this because they don't want us thinking. They don't want us thinking. I mean, in the hypothetical, <laughs> some kind of dream. Well, I don't even know if this is a dream. This, but if we all, if every human being woke up tomorrow morning and said, all right, I will not enable what I know to be the lie <laughs> all day today, it would change. <laughs> it could not function. If every human being got up tomorrow and said, I will not enable it, I will not participate in the lie today, it would change. See, but that's not going to happen in, the, in our lifetime, right? Well, I don't know. I should never say never. But I don't see it. <laughs> but anyway, about us being in the right place and in the right time, because in our place in the evolution, it's how we use our intelligence that says, because no one can control what's going to happen, even those in authority, they can't control it. They've got us intimidated and they've distorted our perceptional realities, all right, so that we don't see as clearly as we should. But no one can really control it. But what we can do and what we will do all right, is we will influence the evolution. We will influence if we use our intelligence as clearly and coherently as we can, as often as we can, then the evolutionary future will be more clear and coherent for us. If we use it pretending to think, but we're not really thinking because, you know, then that means the future, the evolutionary future will be unclear and unthinking. See, this is the participation, this is the, because this is the power relationship we have to reality. Just like an earthquake has, you know, an earthquake or a tornado. We're, remember now, we are shapes of the earth. And we have consciousness and we have being, we have essence. So it's like we're drops of rain, you know, and enough drops of rain get together, you know, and you, get a little, you can make a real storm. And the authoritarian system has to adjust to the storm. They can't find it or indict it. They can't, you know. When it snows, the next time you get shut in in Chicago, remember your relationship to power because you're a snowflake, all right? And once we understand our relationship to power, then, then this other thing that is the wind, this other thing, right, it appears. Whether we, it works individually or collectively, but see, but we have to understand to use our intelligence because this is our create. Then how good, how good are we at creating with our intelligence? Then let's look at our own personal dark sides and the things that give us our fears and our doubts. This is how good we can use our creative ability. This is how effectively we could use it. I'm just a spectator here. 
times of transcending time, I should have done what I could, but went and did what I would. Don't be playing games, that'll start me playing too. The way shadows cross the line, I may have played more games than you. In the way angels kiss, we have this time around. Comes down to this, where we're going is how we're bound. The dormant violence of the subtle mind makes the cleanest cut, the hardest cut to find. That part where anger alone can't keep its promises of revenge, it takes the dance with rage to put fire to that page. When the laughing and the living play it down, it plays out to the dying and the crying and whatever is left out. Democracy. I want to say this because, see, it's about our responsibility and intelligent use of our thoughts and, you know, thinking of, just thinking about things and seeking more clarity. See, as a native person, democracy means absolutely nothing to me. <laughs> All right? We just think, if we just look at things, democracy, it's supposed to be about the majority rule. So let's look at the birth of democracy on this hemisphere. The birth of democracy on this hemisphere, if you were Indian, and incidentally the majority, <laughs> you were automatically the enemy. So you didn't get to play. And if you were a woman, you were mentally inferior, so you didn't get to play either. And if you were a, a black, you were property, so you didn't get to play. And if you were a white male that did not own land, you had no taxable value, so you didn't get to play. This is the reality of the seed that was planted there. So the smallest number of people, and they were thieves and murderers, <laughs> they decided what are the grand institutions and rah-rahs now that people go around trying to save. Well, you know, see, every generation has the responsibility to create the living reality and way that they're going to live with the earth. It's not right. We have the responsibility to do this. It is irresponsible when we keep ourselves chained to dark age controlling thoughts, all right, that are going to mess up the lineage of our descendancy. So we have to think about certain things. See, and for us as Native people, see, now that we're the smallest numerical minority, right? They say vote. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't kill me. What, you left me alive because you think I'm stupid? <laughs> Yeah, vote. See, so to me, it's all just a scam. It's part of that magician's waving the, the handkerchiefs and stuff. So I think that we have, to me, like a responsibility. And I'm not saying people vote or don't vote. I'm, not say, I'm just saying this is my observation. See, and I don't think that democracy is the solution. I think, you know, because I've had people say, see, I come from a tribe. A tribe lives with the land in a tribal way. See, I understand that reality much more better. See, and I get people coming up to me and saying, well, no, democracy in the pure form, the way it's really supposed to be. See, and my attitude is, it is what it really is supposed to be. Don't you get it? Heroin for your consciousness. It's heroin for your intelligence. Shoot this up and go on a trip, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it'll make you lethargic and everything. It's got all the elements there. <laughs> now, I never tried heroin, okay? But I've been around democracy, and I, and I know some heroin users, so I know... <laughs> I remember what I saw. <laughs> but we need to think about what it is that we're going through. And for us, see, it's, we think our way through. Think our way through. Our clarity and our coherency, and we all have it, you know, and, and it deals with, all right, I really am going to get out of here, but we have a responsibility. And responsibility is like response and ability. So we have a responsibility, all right, to use our gifts as responsibly as we can. And as a part of that, whatever our intentions are in this world, it's about synchronicity. You know, we have motives, we have intentions, we have understandings, and then we have actions. Those things have to be synchronized when a good intention is to have a good result. You know, there are certain things that we just need to really to look at. But we need to always be honest with ourselves. We should always tell ourselves the truth. 
Because if we're going to pass anything real on to the next generation, we can love them and care for them however we want. But I guarantee you, if we're not real to ourselves, what we pass on to them is going to be affected by that lack of reality. This is about our responsibility, and we can't blame anybody about it, man. It's our responsibility. But response and ability. It is our ability, and we should respond with it. It's very crucial to whatever's going to go on because we're not going to leave them political systems or economic systems or any of these other things, all right, that are going to ensure their survival. But how they understand who they are and the purpose and reason of their intelligence, this is what's going to keep them going. The ability to use our intelligence, everything now is being programmed to keep us from thinking. Jump on a Nintendo and listen to the buzz, or, you know, <laughs> the kill and everything. The age of information means <laughs> don't think. Carrying on destructive traditions, we've been taking turns falling into ourselves. Soft as we've been, there's no cushioning our falls. There was a crazy lady shouting from the sidelines, you can't take it with you, so why take it now? It's all one big insane mistake being made here. Wage slaves must escape this lifeless cycle. Rage master spews his meaningless promises, acidic lies blinding to the mind's eye, surrendering living to submissions get by. Look at yourself in dismal pretense, pretending freedom as though that's a defense. There was a crazy lady shouting from the sidelines, there are no secrets here, only shames and disgraces. Pavlov's rats snicker at what you don't recognize. You only see what the mirror wants you to see. Craving upward mobility means someone's tied down. Weird bondage trips in straight-laced fashion. Business as usual keeps cracking its profit whip. In the marketplaces of products, you're the main product. Obedience pays, but it doesn't pay enough to break even. Not much of a trade getting ahead for losing your mind. There was a crazy lady shouting from the sidelines, Babylon is doing again what it's always done before. Fronting its dark side with more new pretty plastic, telling you the ticket to heaven is do what they say. Don't look at their hands if you can't handle blood. Don't look at their heart if you can't stand the cold. Each lie you embrace means you blind yourself to a truth, burdening yourself, picking up, carrying Babylon's deceit. Paradox, living without vision, dying to see the light while the sun's on fire and we're part of the sun. By the way, there's nothing wrong with us except how we see or don't see. In this whole other sense of things, we're, just, we're the human beings, man, and that's what we are. And what I was saying about the severance from the ancestral past... You know, like that spiritual severance, see? If we don't figure out something here now, see? And we live in the right time and right place. There's no mistake there. See, we're here because <laughs> for whatever reason, but it's the right time and the right place to meet the need of the evolution. If we understand that, then we will meet that need. We will, we will be up to it and we will meet that need because what's going to happen, we cannot control what's going to happen in the future, but how we use our individual and collective coherency will influence the evolutionary outcome, all right, of what, the, of what this reactionary, non-thinking, exploitive, manipulative beast has in mind. See, we cannot outfight them. There may be times to fight, but we cannot outfight them because they invented that kind of death. We can outthink them and we can outlive them. But every provocation through history since they invented that kind of death, every provocation has been to get us at some point to try to outfight them. And so to me, it's like, no, in reality, we got to outthink them. And if we look at some of the little things about it, right, we're surrounded in a reality where you have to have permission to think. That's called chain of command. See, so if you really, really think about it, the guerrilla warrior of the future is going to be the one that thinks. Because, and, and their legions, you know, they don't have permission to think. See, only a few get to think. See, this starts to equalize out the numbers, <laughs> all right? Because while we're overwhelmed, all of a sudden, maybe we become at least numerically close to equal because in the, whatever their system is, only X amount of them are allowed to think. And that's the reality of it. See, we have to think. We have to look at what it is and seriously see it. 
you know? And if we see things, you know, that other people don't see, that doesn't make us paranoid. Or even if it does, maybe it should. <laughs> There's a reason for paranoia, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm going to finish with these two poems, and I, I appreciate, you know, your listening and, and uh, whatever you got. me up. My mama didn't bring me into this world to let it eat me up. It might have beat me up, fucked me up, but it didn't eat me up. It might have woke me up. Sounds from the crack of dawn, somewhere hanging from an angel's wing, birth is terminal, and the ordeal is the happening in between. It might have shook me up, Memories of the future. Remember not too long ago I was lost and running. Running without answers. Not looking for answers, just lost and running. It might have messed me up. Living on the defense for offenses I committed. And I guess those times when I don't care anymore are the most desperate or most selfish times I know. It might have tripped me up breaking old promises to make new promises. And a dark side of good, sometimes trying is an excuse or a mind game played just to keep a thing the same. It might have twisted me up. Times I wasn't responsible for what I did. Then come the times of consequence that I recognize as mine. And because I can still recognize, I know it hasn't used me up. My mama didn't bring me into this world to let it eat me up. It might have beat me up, fucked me up, but it didn't eat me up. I think about how I'm doing, but I don't know what I'm thinking. Shattering into shadow light, reflecting thoughts I can't relieve. My heart doesn't hurt anymore. But my soul does. Maybe that's what souls are for, to take the hurt the heart can't take. Distance playing tag, playing tricks with whatever it is I can't find. My weaknesses are my band-aids covering for how I don't bleed. In all the stones I threw, some were for flinging, some were for bringing, and some I never knew living painted into a picture, dripping off all these paintings, the colors of emotions, seeking any kind of devotions. Some things are private between me and the dead, and some of the rest is better off left unsaid, and I thank you for your listening. Dr. L, ladies and gentlemen.